Once again, we've come to the end of the liturgical year, and once again, the church puts the end of the world before our eyes in the reading. Once again, I remind you that even though this is an exciting topic, we don't want to get all excited or have some sort of chicken little type of fit when we start thinking about it, okay? The great Belgian Jesuit, St. John Birchman, gives us a perfect example of how we ought to react to this topic. One day during recreation, he was shooting pool with some other seminarians, and one of the seminarians turned to him and said, hey, if you found out the world was about to end right now, what would you do? And without looking up, St. John Birchman said, I'd keep right on shooting pool. Now, what's the point of the story? St. John was supposed to be taking recreation, which he was. He was supposed to be in the state of grace, which he was. In other words, he was doing just exactly what he was supposed to be doing right at that moment. And that's exactly the same thing that our Lord expects of each one of us. If we're in the state of grace when we die, that's what really matters, okay? Doing, being in the state of grace and doing our duty. Remember, the most important thing is not when we live, but it's how we die. That's the most important thing any one of us will do. If we die in the state of grace, then we're saved. It's that simple. Okay, having said that, before we get started, quick review. Make sure we all understand what a type is. What's a type? A type is a person, place, or action that actually exists, but it's also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. A type is a person, thing, or action that actually exists, but it's also intended by God to point forward, to prefigure, to foreshadow a future person, thing, or action. Consider an example from the scriptures to see how this works. In the book of Judges, we see Jael. Now, this is the woman who saves the people of Israel. How does this woman save the people of Israel? She takes a tent stake and pounds it through the head of an enemy general. It's a great book. Anyway, now there's three types there, at least. Okay, obviously Israel really exists of itself. But Israel is also intended by God to prefigure the Catholic Church. So Israel is a type of the true church, the Catholic Church. The enemy general really existed, but he's also intended by God to represent Satan and the enemies of the church. So the enemy general is a type of the devil, okay? And Jael, the woman who crushed the head of this enemy general, really existed too, but she's also intended by God to prefigure her. And if you look at the statue, at least from this angle, you can see what she's doing. She's crushing the head of the serpent. She's standing right on it, okay? In other words, we can look at Jael, and see foreshadowings of Our Lady. So what's a type? A type is a person, a thing or action that really exists, which is also intended by God to prefigure or foreshadow a future person, thing or action. Okay, that's introduction. Let's turn to the topic. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, St. Paul explicitly teaches that the day of the Lord, judgment day, that is to say the end of the world, can't come until first there be an apostasy, a great falling away from the true faith, a great revolt against the true faith. And then in the wake of that apostasy, the great apostasy, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, be revealed. In previous years, we've seen that the fathers and doctors have explained what this apostasy means. For example, St. Thomas explains that this apostasy will be separation from the faith, and from obedience to the Pope. Pope St. Leo the Great, living in the year 400, teaches that indeed the great apostasy will mean abandoning the faith and obedience to the Pope. St. Augustine adds this event must precede the coming to the Antichrist. And St. Augustine adds that not all will abandon the faith, but that few will retain it. For the next two weeks, we'll consider a period in history which the fathers and doctors have always seen as a very clear type of the great apostasy. We'll consider a ruler from that time whom the fathers have considered to be a clear type of the Antichrist, the man of sin. Now remember, these are types. That means that this historical period, the man obviously really exists, but they also prefigure the apostasy and the Antichrist. Why do we want to study this man in his times? Because the clearer we see his foreshadowings, the clearer we can make up prefigurings. The clearer an idea will give us an actual future reality that they foreshadow, okay? And God wants us to think about these things. Not to have a fit about them, not to get worried, 
But he's told us about it. He's revealed it to us. So he wants us to think about it. Okay. So the time we're going to speak of is in the middle of the 4th century. The ruler is the Roman Emperor Flavius Claudius Julianus, more commonly known as Julian the Apostate. He's born in 331, becomes Caesar of the West in 355, and rules the entire empire from 361 to 363. The great Carl Newman gives a thumbnail sketch of the situation. Quote, Julian was preceded, nay, he was nurtured by heresy, by that first great heresy which disturbed the peace and the purity of the church. About 40 years before he became emperor arose the pestilent Arian heresy which denied that Christ was God. It ate its way through the, among the rulers of the church like a canker, and at one time it was all but dominant throughout Christendom. The few holy and faithful men who witnessed for the truth cried out with error and awe and terror at the apostasy that Antichrist was coming. They called it the forerunner of Antichrist. And true, his shadow came. Julian was educated in the bosom of Arianism by some of its principal upholders. In the due time, he fell away to paganism, became a hater and persecutor of the church, and was cut off before he had reigned out the brief period, which will be the real Antichrist duration. Close quote, Cardinal Newman. So Julian rose up during the Arian heresy, turned from that to paganism, then to hatred and persecution of the church, was cut off after a short reign. For the next two weeks, we'll take a very brief look at each one of these points. The Arian heresy. Because of the time, we're not going to consider the theological aspects of the Arian heresy in itself. The basic problem is that Arians denied that Christ was God. In order to deal with these people, in 325, the Council of Nicaea expanded the Apostles' Creed to make it clear what we really believe. The creed we're going to sing right after the sermon. This is the exp- All that stuff, making sure that you can't get confused on who Christ our Lord is, that's why it's there. Creeds make it clear what we really believe. Words really matter. At any rate, the situation of the church and the society was a complete disaster. As a great doctor of the church, St. Jerome wrote shortly after Julian's death, the world, the whole world awoke and groaned to find itself Arian. What was the moral atmosphere of the society that was so drenched in heresy? A former classmate, actually went to school with him, a former classmate of Julian, the great bishop and doctor of the church, St. Basil the Great, describes the situation. Quote, The doctrines of true religion are overturned. There's complete immunity in sinning. Everyone walks according to his heart's desire. Vice knows no bounds. The people know no restraint. Men in authority are afraid to speak. All the while, unbelievers laugh at what they see. Men of weak faith are shaken. Faith is uncertain. Souls are drenched in ignorance. While every blasphemous tongue wags free, the holy things are trodden underfoot. Close quote, St. Basil the Great. St. Jerome gives details about the situation in Rome. Quote, I cannot bring myself to speak of the many virgins who daily fall. Some go so far as to take potions that they may ensure barrenness and thus murder human beings almost before their conception. Some, when they find themselves with child through their sin, use drugs to procure abortion. They drench themselves with wine to intoxication. When they go out, they do their best to attract notice and with nods and winks attract troops of young fellows to follow them. Close quote, St. Jerome. So in short, society was overflowing with sin, rebellion, vice, religious ignorance, blasphemy, heresy, sacrilege, drunkenness, promiscuity, contraception, and abortion. Okay, now in the midst of all this, what's the general moral status of the clergy? St. Jerome comments on the priests, and I'll use euphemisms, and I'll make it short. Quote, I blush to speak of it. It is so shocking. Yet though sad it is true, this plague of loose women running with the clergy. Close quote. How about the bishops? A renowned scholar of the church fathers notes, quote, At one point during the fourth century, perhaps the number of Catholic bishops in possession of sees, a, position, a bishop in the possession of a see is the one who's actually ruling the diocese. The number of Catholic bishops in possession 
of sees as opposed to Aryan bishops in possession of sees was no greater than something between 1 and 3% of the total. Close quote, Father Jurgens. Priests running with companions with loose morals and 97 to 99% of the bishops that are ruling dioceses, out and out heretics. Small wonder then, in 350, in the midst of this catastrophe, one of Julian's contemporaries, the great bishop and doctor of the church, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, said, quote, Now is the apostasy, for men have fallen away from the right faith. Now the church is filled with heretics in disguise, for men have fallen away from the truth and have itching ears. Most have departed from right words and rather, rather choose evil than desire the good. This, therefore, is the apostasy, and the enemy is soon to be looked for. Close quote, St. Cyril of Jerusalem. This, therefore, is the apostasy, and the enemy is soon to be looked for. They didn't have to wait long. Julian the Apostate. In 337, Julian's uncle, his emperor Constantine, died. In order to eliminate any threats to his power, the new emperor, one of Constantine's son and Julian's first cousin, led a massacre of Julian's family, sparing only the six-year-old Julian and his eight-year-old brother. Then the emperor saw to it that the boys got a strict Aryan education. So Julian not only grew up in a heretical Aryan surroundings, he grew up in a murderous family to boot. With examples like that, it's not surprising that Julian was not particularly enamored of Christianity. According to Julian's own account, by the age of 20, he began to live a double life. Publicly, he continued to act as if he were a Christian, attending Mass, he's a lector, so he'd sing the readings, and so forth, while privately he was engaged in the most vile pagan rites and rituals. While he's still a student and leading this double life, he went to Athens. The public reason why Julian went there was to study. And amazingly enough, he actually wound up as a classmate of two doctors of the church. We've already mentioned St. Basil the Great, but he's also a classmate of St. Gregory Nazianzen. There's also a private reason. The private reason that Julian went to Athens is to secretly acquaint himself with various pagan priests and sorcerers. Julian was filled with a desire to master the black arts. One of the pagans that Julian sought out for instruction told him of a sorcerer named Maximus, who only a short time before had invited a group of his friends, including Julian's pagan instructor, to the temple of Hecate. Now, if you don't know, this is the moon goddess, the goddess of the crossroads, the goddess of the underworld. She's the queen of black magic and patroness of witches, and typically she's portrayed with a torch or with torches. One pagan historian, contemporary historian, summarizes what happened at the temple. Quote, Maximus burned a grain of incense and recited a hymn to himself. Then it happened. The statue of the goddess first began to smile and then seemed to laugh out loud. Those present were alarmed, but Maximus tried to calm them by saying that torches which the goddess held in their hands would soon burst into flames. And they actually did. When Julian heard about this, he said, Farewell, keep your books, you have shown me my man. And when he said that, he set out for Ephesus. Close quote. So in Ephesus, Julian begins to study the black arts under Maximus. St. Gregory Nancyanzen describes a watershed in- incident in Julian's initiation into the occult. In order to be initiated into certain rites, Julian was let down into the ground in an underground sanctuary. During this initiation, suddenly there's all these unearthly noises and terrible smells, and then fiery apparitions, these demons, begin to appear. Naturally, Julian was terrified, and he fell back on his old habits. He made the sign of the cross. As soon as he made the sign of the cross, these terrifying apparitions disappeared. The sorcerer starts this whole initiation process again. The same demons reappear, and Julian gets so nervous that without even thinking about it, he makes the sign of the cross again. Bang, they're gone. Then he begins to despair because the demons have vanished. That's how whack the guy is. He wonders at the power of the cross. He asks the guy, well, what about this cross? The demons can't bear it, and they flee every time I do that. The, The sorcerer, who's a liar, responds, Julian should not think anything of this sort, that in fact those demons are not afraid of the cross at all. 
they went away because you've just made yourself abominable by making the sign of the cross. And so he tricks Julian and initiates the poor man into these demonic mysteries. At the end of the initiation, it's St. Gregory Nanzians and says, quote, quote, Julian reascends full of demon, both in his mind and his actions. From that day forward, he was possessed. Close quote, St. Gregory Nanzianzen, bishop and doctor of the church. Now, in spite of the fact that Julian continued to go to Mass in order to keep up the appearance of being a Christian, from this point on, for the rest of his life, he's completely dedicated to paganism. Whether he's offering up bloody sacrifices, consulting oracles, or reading entrails, he spent the remainder of his life following the guidance of demons. He regularly experienced apparitions and visitations from pagan gods and goddesses and other specters, all of which were, of course, demons. In November of 355, he's made the Caesar of the West, and then in 361, after the death of his cousin, he becomes the emperor. His double life comes to an end when he suddenly throws off the mask, abandons Christianity, declares himself to be the pagan high priest, begins publicly offering sacrifice in the pagan temples, and then invites his subjects to also adopt pagan worship. Persecution. Julian hated the church and intended to destroy it, but he took a very subtle approach, an approach that was very much in harmony with his previous lifestyle of publicly appearing to be one thing, a devout Catholic or Christian, Arian actually, while privately he's actually something completely different, a devotee of black magic and paganism. Julian's first move was to address the leaders of the different Christian religious factions. Now, that included not only Catholics, but also heretical sects like the Arians, the Donatists, the Novatians, and so forth. What does he tell them? A pagan associate records that Julian, quote, politely advised them to set aside their differences and with each, without fear or opposition, should observe his own beliefs, close quote, Manius. Then he remits, you know, commutes all the sentences of all the Catholics who have been banished or imprisoned under his cousin. Next, he grants full religious liberty to everyone. So in a word, Julian promulgates laws which which, uh, promote freedom of conscience, toleration, religious liberty. He brings back Catholics like St. Athanasius who have been banished by the Arians. This all sounds very reasonable and makes Julian look like a model ruler that's overflowing with goodwill and thoughtful care for all his subjects, no matter what their beliefs. We might be wondering, how is this supposed to be a persecution? If Julian hated the church, why would he grant religious freedom and bring back the banished Catholics? What's up with that? Well, as one of Julian's own pagan associates reported, the real reason that Julian granted freedom of conscience to the church as well as to the different heretical Christian sects, was so they'd get fighting with each other. It's the ancient Roman tact of of divide and conquer. Contemporary authors report that he recalls the banished priests and bishops for exactly the same reason. His next step was to decree that the pagan temples be opened and the worship of the gods be restored. And soon, the pagans, who are emboldened by their new status, start desecrating churches and cemeteries here and there throughout the empire and attack and torture and kill priests and consecrated virgins. And now a very, very important part of the subtle persecution becomes visible. He has a systematic pattern of selective law enforcement. The local governors are fully aware of the emperor's attitude, so they tolerated such crimes as long as they're committed by pagans. One author summarizes the situation, quote, Christians suffered abuse and violence from the hands of pagans, acting with the tacit approval of the authorities. At the most, the authorities intervened only to deplore an accomplished fact and not to punish it. At times, they found pretexts to justify the pagans and declare that they had acted with reserve. In a word, there was a disguised persecution guided by the hand and power, close quote. In fact, when one governor made the mistake of punishing someone responsible for killing Christians, Julian promptly removed him from office. But when Christians retaliated for such attacks, or attacked pagans themselves, it was a totally different issue. They were put to death. Come what may, in the eyes of the state, the Christians were virtually always wrong. Julian decided in order to render them completely helpless, the Christians should also be deprived of their culture. He starts by issuing a constitution on educational reform in the public schools. 
It requires teachers to be both moral and competent in their fields. Obviously, it sounds perfectly respectable, but at the same time he issues a public law, he also issues a private circular letter which explains the real meaning of the public law. There's always two levels here. There's, there's what it appears to be and what it really is. The letter's entitled, On Christian Teachers, and in it, Julian specifically bans Christian teachers from participating in the schools. The result, as one church historian points out, is that a Christian teacher either had to deny his faith or give up his career, and thus become a poverty-stricken social derelict. Quote, Julian's aim was that the Christians were to lose their social standing. At the very most, they could be for a time grudgingly tolerated in unimportant posts. There was to be no bloody persecution, but rather slow asphyxiation and inevitable paralysis. Close quote. He enacts similar policies with regard to government posts and military service. In every possible way, Julian enacts policies to, quote, exclude Christians from the public life and replace them with pagans, close quote. The clergy were targeted. They were accused of stirring up civil unrest, which, of course, is a natural result of bringing the bishops that have banished, uh, been banished from their sees to come in where you have an Arian bishop and a Catholic bishop in the same place to grant religious freedom to everything. There's going to be the civil unrest with the pagan attacks and whatnot. And then the clergy are accused of, of, of fomenting this, and Julian moves. A contemporary of Julian, a Christian author named Sozman, explains, Although Julian was anxious to advance paganism by every means, yet he deemed it the height of imprudence to employ force or vengeance. Besides, there were so many Christians in every city, it would have been no easy task for the rulers even to number them. He did not even forbid them to assemble together for worship. Instead, he expelled the clergy from all the cities, saying truly that if there, indeed there were none to teach or dispense the sacraments, religion itself would, in the course of time, fall into oblivion. Close quote. Another key element in this culture war, and it's true in every culture war, is the removal or destruction of visible Christian signs and symbols. For example, Sozman reports, quote, Having heard at Caesarea Philippi, there was a celebrated statue of Christ which had been erected by a woman whom the Lord had cured of a flow of blood. We just heard that gospel a couple weeks ago. It says Rhea Philippi, she, she erected a statue. There were herbs grown in front of it that were miracles and whatnot. Anyway, he hears about it. So Julian commands it to be taken down and a statue of himself erected in its place. Close quote. Now before we close today, let's summarize Julian's strategy. He's using a veiled persecution which public acts which seem fairly reasonable such as appeals to tolerance of other religious foods, to religious liberty, and to freedom of conscience, are actually intended to be used to promote a pagan agenda. He's established a deliberate policy of selective law enforcement, also intended to promote the pagan agenda while harming Christians. He launches a carefully planned culture war designed to crush Christian resistance and their visible presence in society using tactics such as de-Christianizing the schools, de-Christianizing the civil service, de-Christianizing the military, as well as removing visible Christian signs and symbols and expelling clergy from the cities. And all this began in a society awash in sin and moral degradation, with the church suffering terribly from the wounds of heresy, from priests leading immoral lives, and from heretical bishops. There's plenty more. The only problem in writing a sermon like this is to keep it short enough. Anyway, we can get the general picture. We'll finish the story next week. Let's close today with an observation from the author Sozeman, that Christian contemporary of Julian. Quote, If Julian shed less blood than preceding persecutors of the church, and if he devised fewer punishments for the torture of the body, nonetheless, he was much worse in other respects. <laughs>